Well, good evening and welcome to our time together. My name is Dave, Dave Bell. I'm one of the members of Moneyhole Church and I've been asked uh, just to spend a few moments with you tonight, uh, opening up God's Word and looking very particularly at the end of John chapter 17. I have to admit that it is slightly uh, bizarre to be speaking to a camera rather than a congregation, um, but we trust that as we open up God's Word tonight, He will speak to us even though we are separated in person. So before we turn to God's Word, would you spend just a couple of moments praying with me? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your Word. We want to thank you that it is life to us. We want to thank you that you give us your Spirit to speak to us, to make our hearts receptive to your Word to help us understand it, and Father, by your grace, to help us apply it prayerfully to our lives. Father, we want to thank you that today we celebrate that wonderful joy, Father, that wonderful news of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in him we have complete forgiveness for our sins, Father. We have complete redemption. Uh, we are restored to that relationship with you, and we thank you for how precious that is to us. And Father, we ask that you'd forgive us that so often that relationship is not as precious to us as it should be, that so often we take our eyes off you and off the Lord Jesus and we seek our pleasures in other places. Father, we know the futility of this. Forgive us, we pray, and we pray that as we gather around your word tonight, you would speak to us, you would renew us, Father, you would renew our love for you, you would cause us to see um, something again of the beauty of the Lord Jesus. And pray, Father, that you would be speaking here, not me. That these would be your words, Father, taken by your Spirit and applied to people's hearts and lives for your glory. And we ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, just before we actually turn to, uh, or before I start preaching or explaining God's word, just turn to it with me uh, and let's read it together. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Well, I wonder if you've ever had the experience of being with someone as they speak their last words. It's not an experience that I have had but it's probably an experience that some listening to this will have had. Or if you haven't had that experience, I wonder what your last words would be. If you knew they were to be your last words, what would you choose to say in the last few moments of your life? We attach a lot of importance to the last words that people speak, don't we? We assume that in the face of death, People choose or people use their last breaths to say what really matters to them and what is really important to them. We believe that actually people's last words reflect something of what's really important to them. They reflect their priorities. Well, as we turn to this passage tonight, that's really the situation that we are in. Although these aren't the actual last words of Jesus, they are certainly some of his last words. After finishing this prayer, he goes to Gethsemane. He knows while he is praying this prayer that actually the horrors of Gethsemane and of the cross and of his mock trial are immediately before him. So we are actually in an incredibly privileged position tonight. We see an insight 
into Jesus' priorities. We see an insight into what matters most to him. And we have seen over the last few weeks, haven't we, that Jesus starts this prayer by praying for himself. He then expands this prayer to praying for his disciples. And now he prays not just for his disciples, but as it says in verse 20, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This prayer that we're coming to tonight shows us Jesus' priorities for every single Christian believer throughout all of history. So we are immensely privileged and let us take some time tonight to really think about what Jesus' priorities are for all of all believers in him. Well, I think actually there are two priorities that Jesus shows us in this prayer. And I think the first one is uh, quite obvious, really. Uh, it's a major theme that's running through this prayer. And it is, it is the priority of unity. So look with me at verse 21. Um, that all of them may be one, Father. That is his prayer. He's praying for all believers that all of them may be one. Verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one. Or verse 23. May they be brought to complete unity. Now, Jesus' first priority for his people is that they be united. Now, when I first read that, I, I have to admit that I, I thought it was a little bit of an anticlimax. Um, I don't know what your response is, um, but there's lots of things that I would have wished Jesus to pray for for me. Um, but unity probably wouldn't have been one of those things. Well, as we delve into this passage, I think we'll come to see that actually this is anything but an anticlimax. And Jesus' prayer for unity uh, is a wonderful blessing to us. So there's a few things that I just want us to understand and to see about this unity. The first thing that I want us to see is that he is calling us to the type of unity that exists between the persons of the Trinity. So look again at verse 21, that all of them may be one father, just as you are in me and I am in you. The Holy Spirit isn't mentioned here explicitly, but we know from the rest of Scripture that actually that wonderful unity between the Father and the Son is that unity that exists between all persons of the Godhead, all persons of the Trinity. And look at the language that is used here. It's talking about oneness, being in each other. And this language really sh it shows us something of how closely the persons of the Godhead are, are identified with each other. This is a complete alignment. This is total identification with one, one another. This is complete unity. Unity of heart, unity of mind, unity of will. This is the unity that exists amongst the Trinity. And we can't fully understand that. Um, my mind has been slightly blown trying to get my head around this passage. And this is one of the truths that has really challenged me that actually we can never understand what ex that, that mystery, that unity between the persons of the Trinity. But this is the kind of unity that we are called to as well, of being totally one, of being almost so closely identified with each other that you're almost in each other. So have a look again at verse 21, that all of them may be one, just as you are in me and I am in you. This is the same kind of unity that all believers in Christ are to have. This is unity of heart, that we are united in our love for Jesus, that he, as a body of his people, he is our first love. We are united in our minds, in the truths that we believe, in the, in the core doctrines of Christianity, that we all hold these things dear and that we guard them and that we protect them and that we stay united in them. And unity in will as well. Our, our will as a, as a church, as believers in Christ, is that actually we should want to see Jesus uh, proclaimed and glorified. And this unity surpasses all kinds of divisions. So we might be able to draw all sorts of divisions um, among the people of God. We might be able to say that we are racially different. We come from lots of different races and ethnic backgrounds. We might say that we are culturally different, that we have lots of different cultures, that we are socially different. There would be all sorts of divisions that we may draw. 
But actually, this unity surpasses all of those. Those divisions mean nothing when we consider the unity that we are to have. We are to have that one heart, that one mind, that one will. Now, unity does not mean uniformity. Please don't get me wrong here. As Christians, God has given us our own personalities, our own preferences, um, and our own idiosyncrasies. This doesn't mean that we all have to be the same. Jesus is not praying for a cult-like uniformity or unanimity. But he is praying that we would be united together, that that, that that unity between the Trinity, between the persons of the Trinity, would be would be present amongst um, believers in Christ. And in fact, it's important to see that our unity is the unity between the persons of the Trinity. So uh, again, verse um, 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And into 23, I in them and you in me. Jesus is saying that actually this unity that exists between the persons of the Godhead is the same unity that exists between believers in Christ. To put it somewhat crudely, our vertical unity with God leads to our horizontal unity with all believers. We are grafted into the unity that exists between the persons of the Trinity and that now influences our relationships with each other. So the bottom line here, Jesus is praying for a radical unity amongst his followers, that his followers might be radically united with the persons of the Trinity and also with each other. Now, that's all very well, you might say, but that being the case, how do we come into that unity? Well, I want to suggest that the answer is in verse 22. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus here is explicitly saying that he gives us his glory to unite us. So that then raises the question, well, what is this glory of Christ that he also shares with us? And to understand the answer to this, look with me at the first few verses of this prayer. Look at verse one. Jesus says, Father, the time has come. The time of his death has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. And in verse four, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. What is the glory of Christ? It is the entire narrative of salvation. It is him leaving the glory that he knew with the Father, coming, to the, coming and being born into the world as a man, enduring the horrors and the scorn of the cross, rising again to life and reascending to heaven, reclaiming the glory that was his, and now also with eternal glory for his work of salvation that he has completed on behalf of his people. In a nutshell, Jesus' glory is the gospel. And it is the gospel that Jesus gives to us to unite us. How does that work? Well, turn with me very briefly to Romans chapter 6, verse 5. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Jesus is saying here that as we trust in him, as we believe in him, his death becomes our death. And his resurrection becomes our resurrection. We are united with Christ in his death and in his life. And having been united with Christ, we are also united with all believers in Christ. So if we want this radical unity, we receive this radical unity from Jesus through the gospel. That is the means. Jesus gives us his glory. He gives us the gospel to unite us radically with himself, with the persons of the Trinity, and with each other. Well, there is still another question to be answered, isn't there? We have this radical unity in the gospel, but for what purpose? Why is this a priority for Jesus? Well, again, I think the answer is fairly obvious. Look at verse 21 for, with me. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Or verse 23, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 
This unity that Jesus gives us is a powerful witness to the world. It's a powerful witness of the authenticity of Christ, that he is who he said he was, that he is the Son of God who has come to die and to take away our sin and to rise again to new life. And it proves, it is a witness that proves the legitimacy of the church, that proves that the Lord Jesus and the Father loves them. This is a very, very powerful witness, isn't it? I wonder how many people have come to know and to love Jesus because they have seen something of this unity amongst his followers. They may not have used that word, unity. Maybe they said that they were attracted by the love that his followers had for one another. Maybe they were attracted by the care that they saw or the joy that they had with each other. But at the heart of all that is this unity that we have as believers. And consider as well the reverse side of that. How many people have been put off Christianity because of disunity, because of schisms or sex, because the, the people of God have not been united? Our witness, our witness, our, maybe our biggest witness potentially, possibly, is this unity that the Lord Jesus gives us as his body. So the bottom line, do you know this unity with Christ and his people? Is this something that you experience for yourself? Do you know it? If not, today is Easter Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Now, today, why don't you put your trust in him? Why don't you believe in him? Why don't you be united with him in his death and in his resurrection? And if you do know this unity, then let me ask you another question. Is it a priority for you? It's one of Jesus's great priorities. Is it your priority? Is it my priority? If we are believers, what are we doing to foster this unity amongst us? Now, one of the advantages of, um, of, of doing things as we're doing at the moment, of having these virtual meetings, is that we also have a virtual meeting afterwards for discussion. And maybe we can make that question, uh, one of the questions that we discuss there. What are we doing to foster this unity amongst us as believers? So Jesus' first priority for us is unity. But secondly, and more briefly, I think he has another very clear priority for us. Look at verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. What is Jesus' second priority? Jesus' second priority is that every believer who loves him, those who the Father has been given, has given to him, that they make it to the end, that they get to heaven, that they spend eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus, looking on his glory. Now, if you are a Christian here this morning, this is a prayer of great comfort and great hope. At the moment, we see Jesus only dimly and we see him by the eye of faith. But there is a time coming when we will be with him in person, when we will see him with our eyes, we will see him with sight, not by faith. And we won't see him dimly. We will see him in all his glory and all his radiance. In fact, we will spend the whole of eternity gazing on Jesus and being fully satisfied and satiated in him. There is a great comfort here, a great consolation. Well, this is a great consolation for us as well in the present. We know something of this comfort and this hope in the present. Look at verses 25 and 26. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus is saying here, that he will continue to make the Father known to us, that he will continue to make him known, that his love may be in us and that Christ himself may be in us. I think this is talking about Jesus' death. At this point, he has made the Father known on earth through his earthly ministry. But the culmination of that ministry is his death. 
and it also refers to the sending of the Holy Spirit. But what this means for believers is that here now in the present, Jesus continues to make the Father known to us. And we continue to reside in the love of the Father and in unity with the Son. We may not have Christ in, in his fullness at the moment in the sense of we do not, we are not in his presence. That is still to come. But nonetheless, we have Christ. We have a foretaste of that wonderful eternity that we will spend with him, gazing upon him. We know that here and now. And that is a huge consolation, isn't it? With the trials and the tribulations of life. Even as we are in lockdown, we can know something of the Lord Jesus with us and being un us being united with him. So let me ask you, do you know this comfort? Do you know this comfort for yourself? Do you have the hope that one day you will be with Jesus in person for the whole of eternity? And do you have the comfort of knowing his presence and the Father's love and unity with Christ here and now? Let me repeat my earlier challenge. If you don't have that comfort, then this is something today that can be yours if you trust in the Lord Jesus, if you repent of your sin and you put your faith in him. And if you do have that comfort, well, that's a great consolation, isn't it? What a consolation and what a glorious hope that we have. Let me conclude. Jesus uses his last words here, at least some of his last words, to show us his priorities for his church. He prays for our unity. He prays for a radical unity, the same unity to exist amongst his followers, amongst his believers, that exists between the persons of the Trinity. He prays that we are radically united with each other and with the persons of the Trinity in the gospel as a powerful witness to the world. And he prays, he prays that we will make it, every single believer will make it to the end, will spend eternity with him in his presence. This passage is a great challenge. It is also a great comfort, isn't it? And let me leave you with that application, with that challenge. Do you know this unity? Do you know this comfort? And if you do, what are you doing to foster them? What are you doing to pursue them in your own life? Let's just spend a few moments in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that here we see the priorities of the Lord Jesus for us. Father, forgive us for when we have been disunited as your people, for when we have not sought that unity with you and in you. Father, we pray that you would help us to be united, help us to have that radical unity in the gospel, that we might have a powerful witness to the world of the value and the authenticity and the beauty of Christ. And help us, Father, to live every day looking forward to that great hope that we have, that one day we will, be, we will be with you in eternity. And help us, Father, to comfort ourselves in the present, knowing, Father, that we have a foretaste here and now of that glory. And we ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen.